Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of X-Men The Last Stand. This 2006 film was Fox's third X-Men movie, and we are breaking down all of these films in our X-Men Stick Stick Rewatch. Directed by Brett Ratner, this film is remembered for some questionable choices and some trouble behind the scenes, but it led to Kelsey Grammer Beast returning for the post credit scene of the Marvels, a cameo that proves that all of the Fox X-Men films are on the table for MCU crossovers, and we must watch them all, even the less loved ones, where people start saying bitch a lot. Keep it up. I'll spray you in the face, bitch. I'm the juggernaut, bitch! I know, but there's also a lot to love in this film, so let's break down X in the Last Stand for all the Easter eggs, details you missed, and what else besides Frasier, Marvel Studios might bring back for the Mutant Homecoming and Deadpool 3. And by the way, any speculation or potential spoilers for that Deadpool 3 film will be down in the Danger Room section at the end of this video. Okay, as always, the opening 20th Century Fox logo has the X lingering just a bit longer on that fade to black, but then the Marvel logo of all the flipping comic book pages has actually been updated to include moments that are related to what happens in this film. We see Jean Grey as Phoenix saying, I am Phoenix from Uncanny X-Men number 101 in 1976. That was the first appearance of Phoenix years before Chris Claremont's Dark Phoenix Saga would begin in 1980. And in the opinions of many, revitalize Marvel Comics as a brand. Like there's a reason why in the Stranger Things pilot, Will in the year 1982 is reading an issue from the Dark Phoenix Saga X-Men 134 because that storyline was so important to really any kid reading Marvel Comics in the early 80s. And that included this movie's screenwriters, Simon Kinberg and Zach Penn. Kinberg loved the storyline so much that he tried to adapt it again with 2019's Dark Phoenix. But it's really a tough storyline nowadays because you can say that Marvel has really refocused its overpowered Omega level Nexus mutant female into the Scarlet Witch. And it's kind of hard to also do that story and be like, aren't these women crazy? But hey, it could still be fun to see these two fight in Secret Wars. I think we need to see it happen. Not in like a rare way, but like they're they're very powerful, very cool characters. And I just want to see them at least like talk or maybe like team up and kill a bunch of guys. Whatever, I, I feel bad for telling you what to do. Okay, we also see this comic issue of Jubilation Lee saying adamantium and attitude, he's one of a kind, we'd like him back. This is actually from Chris Claremont and Jim Lee's X-Men number seven from 1992. A shot of Magneto with the box above him saying the government C challenge didn't see it that way. This is from Claremont and Lee's X-Men number one in 1991. We see several other images from this early 90s run, which is pretty great. That's when Wolverine's colors were like this auburn red and yellow. We also see this image of Magneto ripping up the bridges of New York, obviously foreshadowing Magneto destroying the Golden Gate Bridge in this movie. We see a few pages from the very first Uncanny X-Men number one, all the way back from 1963 by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, which introduced the X-Men line up included Professor X, Cyclops, Iceman, who kind of looks like a cloud, Angel, and the Beast. And this is before the Beast was blue, but he was barefoot. In this movie, Beast and Angel are introduced to X-Men films. We see an image of Colossus fighting Juggernaut. That's from Uncanny X-Men number 102 in 1976. We also see Juggernaut from X-Men number 46. That's this cover. And then we see this image of Wolverine telling Cyclops, every now and then Summers, and that line actually completes with, I remember why you're still in charge. This is from Joss Whedon's Astonishing X-Men number eight from 2005, which would have made this one of the more recently published inclusions for this 2006 movie. Whatever you think about Joss Whedon, his X-Men run in the first half of that decade was really good. And I like that they include this moment when Cyclops pulled a get off my lawn and cleared a whole field with his optic blast. This movie unfortunately kills off the Cyclops character in a pretty shitty way, but Whedon's Astonishing X-Men was known for the mutant cure storyline that Fox wanted to bring into this film to make it a political conflict with Magneto, but doing so made Kinberg and Penn's Dark Phoenix elements kind of incongruous. So this film opens 20 years ago, which would make it either 1986 or based on the October 2005 issue of the magazine Hank McCoy's reading later, maybe 1985. But either way, this movie de-ages Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen in a very high profile stunt. Technology had been used that way more discreetly in movies like Terminator 3, but these visual effects from Lola, very talented group of artists, just kind of come out front and center in the opening frames of this movie. And initially the effect is pretty good. It holds up. It's because this shot begins on really the surprise of Charles Xavier's feet hitting the ground. Because back in this time, he was still able to walk. The shot keeps the men at a distance. We can't really see their mouths as closely from this angle. And the shot is in motion. So we're just not really scrutinizing the movement of their lips, which is the way we get sucked into the Uncanny Valley right away. Like, look at this clip. I still don't know why I'm here. 
Couldn't you just make them say yes? Yes, I could, but it's not my way. Yeah, it's pretty good, right? Because here's the thing about VFX that social media generally misses the point of. Whenever these things are taken out of context or paused or like zoomed in on, everything looks artificial. You don't look like a genius for posting something on Twitter and being like, doesn't this look terrible? Yeah, because you're posting it on Twitter, dumbass. You look terrible on Twitter. The trick of avoiding falling into the uncanny valley is context and character. And in this case, the context and the characters are, it's just nice to see these two old foes back together as friends in a two shot. The de-aging effect supports that illusion. De-aging and facial deep fakes should always be done in tandem with the actor's physical performance and deliver a magic trick that our hearts long to see. If it ever gets just the slightest whiff of being exploitative, our collective moral conscience is gonna shove us violently into that uncanny valley and force us to hate it no matter how good it looks. And notice how it's not until we are inside with a stationary camera on a close up with McKellen and Stewart that we begin to see the artificiality, like here. We are mutants, Gene. We are like you. But overall, it works, I think, because we are seeing these two guys now from the point of view of young Jean Grey, who doesn't trust these strangers. They look creepy and weird to her because we just heard Charles's voice inside this girl's mind telepathically. By the way, seeing Charles walking in this opening scene is part of a different backstory that we don't really get to see for these characters. X-Men First Class will establish a new way that Charles Xavier gets paralyzed from the waist down. We also see a different walking Charles Xavier in the final scene of X-Men Origins of Wolverine. So yeah, just don't think about it. But I do like the detail that Eric is wearing a red overcoat that looks similar to the red coat that Jean Grey will wear when she succumbs to the Phoenix. Now, already in the first like 30 seconds of the movie, there are a lot of insane visual effects going on. And these, along with the Golden Gate Bridge sequence, made X-Men The Last Stand the most expensive movie of all time at the time of its release. But that said, surprisingly, this X-Men movie made more money than either of its two predecessors. It was the most profitable X-Men movie up until X-Men Days of Future Past. Yeah, it made more than X-Men Origins of Wolverine. It made more than First Class. Now, Jean Grey's father, John, is played by Adrian Ho, who voiced Nightcrawler for the 90s animated series. Yeah, the brochure is great. But what about Jean? What about her illness? If you are indeed my brother, then I will pray to God that you find the wisdom to work through your hatreds. While Charles has the powers of telepathy, Eric Lencher can telekinetically move metal, Jean Grey proves to have both of these powers lifting the cars outside. The neighbor whose lawnmower floats is a cameo by Chris Claremont, and Stan Lee cameos as the neighbor with the hose. Charles asks Jean if she can control this power or let it control her. This movie alters the origin story of the Phoenix as a separate entity, establishing it as kind of a separate mental entity or a persona or an alter that Jean creates as a response to Charles's mental blocks. But of course, in the comics, the Phoenix Force is a cosmic entity that seeks out and inhabits Jean's body from a young age. The origin of the Phoenix Force is one of the details of the 2019 Dark Phoenix film will change, but the way it's defined in this movie, I just think is kind of a bummer because now Jean's power is associated with, you know, like schizophrenia. And back in the aughts and prior to that, movies love to just throw schizophrenia in there without really understanding anything about the condition. This isn't a knock against Famke Jansen, who does a great job in this movie. It's more of just like the script decision to do this. And they didn't need to do this because X2 literally opens with a phoenixy star child. So why not just keep the origin cosmic? Okay, getting off my soapbox here, to jump ahead 10 years to a young Warren Worthington III who's frantically trying to shave off his wings with, oof, is that a zester or a cheese grater? I've definitely seen pieces of a toy train track in that drawer. Youch! And the shame of this father's voice on, oh God, <laughs> not you. This just reminds us that these X-Men movies were a metaphor for the LGBT experience and the pressure for youth to hide themselves from the world. Brian Singer's relationship with this franchise is obviously pretty complicated, given his sexual assault allegations and his fraught relationship with the cast and crew. But after X2, Singer and his writers left the franchise to go make Superman Returns. Fox Studios originally hired Matthew Vaughn to replace Brian Singer, but Vaughn also left the production. At first, it was reported that he left to avoid uprooting his family from the UK to Vancouver. But then just a few months ago, October 2023 at New York Comic-Con, Vaughn said that he actually quit X3 after seeing that a Fox executive had an alternate script draft that opened with a prologue of African kids dying of thirst and Aurora Monroe creating a thunderstorm to save them, which he thought was a really cool idea. But he said the executive actually just planned to use this fake script to get Halle Berry to sign on and then they would have thrown this fake draft in the bin. And Vaughn said that he walked after that, which sounds like a pretty noble thing until you realize what this guy did to Darwin in first class.
Yes, Matthew Vaughn would later return to reboot the franchise in X-Men First Class in 2011. Before X3, after a scramble to find a replacement director, Fox hired Brett Ratner, best known for directing the Rush Hour films. Later on, in fall 2017, Ratner would face sexual assault allegations, and Elliot Page said that Ratner outed the then 18-year-old Page as gay at an X3 meet-and-greet event. This was before Page came out as a trans man. Anna Paquin was also at this event and said that she witnessed it. So look, folks, we are allowed to rewatch these movies like what we like in this franchise, but we just can't sweep all that history under the rug and pretend it didn't happen. So the past two X-Men installments had opening titles that showed nerve cells and a brain sinking with Cerebro. This one shows the blood cells and antibodies of a mutant named Jimmy, aka Leech, whose blood is harvested by Worthington's pharma company to produce a mutant cure. This is actually part of an original opening scene in Worthington Labs where Dr. Rao would have put Jimmy through an MRI type machine, but with the Jean Grey opening instead, we're already kind of feeling the tug of war in this movie between the Dark Phoenix storyline and the cure storyline. But we see these DNA strands through the lenses of a microscope, which is then locked behind the X door. But instead of Cerebro, we're now in a different part of the expansion basement, the Danger Room, the longtime X Men training room, which operates with a kind of holographic augmented reality in a simulation against the Sentinels, with their giant robot heads, similar to the design of the 90s animated series, but redesigned for Days of Future Past. But this not too distant future in the Danger Room is an apocalyptic war zone that looks a lot like what the X Men will face in Days of Future Past's prologue. Hugh Jackman, Wolverine, and Halle Berry Storm return leading this mission with Elliot Page, Kitty Pride, Sean Ashmore, Bobby Drake, Anna Paquin, Rogue, and Daniel Cudmore, Colossus. Colossus and Rogue team up as Rogue absorbs his metal up powers to deflect the debris. Meanwhile, Kitty hugs Bobby to let debris pass through them, which makes Rogue jealous. Wolverine lights a cigar on a nearby flame, reminding me of Marion Ravenwood stopping to sip some loose booze in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Logan says that this was his last cigar, and since we don't see a real cigar in the simulation floor later, I assume this is like a virtual cigar, and Logan is treating this exercise kind of like a video game where he collects inventory like cigars, Storm even calls us out. This isn't a game, Logan. Like whoever designed the Danger Room program must have allowed Logan to smoke cigars inside of that simulation, and I love that. I assume Scott Summers did this, and he just did this because deep down he really loves Logan. Logan tells Colossus to toss him, a move that he will do in the final battle later. This is the Fastball Special, a classic move that Wolverine and Colossus have pulled off many times in the comics, first appearing in X-Men 100 by Chris Claremont. James Marsden returns as Scott Summers. He's letting some of his scruff grow out as he is still mourning and Gene. Since James Marsden would have to leave production early to go film Superman Returns, producers of this film decided to kill off the character in the opening act instead of you know, any other storyline that he could have shot in the first few weeks of production? Films don't have to be shot chronologically, or he could have like recast the character. Why did you kill off a character? There's just a lot of confusing choices in this movie. Like the dialogue in X3 just kind of dumbs down the characters in ways that they weren't dumb in the other films. Like this scene with Rogue and Bobby. Have I ever put any pressure on you? You're a guy, Bobby. Your mind's only on one thing. And that's where the scene ends. Like Bobby never contests that. It's kind of like, yeah, got me there. It's 2006. Guys are supposed to only have one of the five love languages. Like in X2, Bobby and Rogue figured out a system, you know, quick dinty nights, kisses, gloved petting. So why is this an issue now? And by the end of this movie, Rogue depowers herself just so she can hold his hand. What? Okay, on to the Department of Mutant Affairs, presumably the political result of Charles meeting with President McKenna in X2. The quest of the federal agency includes a DNA double helix design on the shield. Kelsey Grammer plays Secretary Hank McCoy hanging upside down and reading this October 2005 edition of Scientific American, which is an actual publication that's been in print since 1845. There's some fun article titles on the cover like Galactic Waves, The Cosmic Necessity of Beautiful Spirals, Odd DNA Reveals Secrets of Human Evolution, Migration and Survival, Tracking Mutations, The Forgotten Era of the Brain control chips, building a better bomb detector, ancient crystals from Earth's first continents. Now you might think these might be like references to Galactus or the Phoenix Force, but no, 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 this is an actual Scientific American cover from October 2005. Now Kelsey Grammer is covered in thick makeup and prosthetics for this movie. When he returns to play the character in the MCU in the Marvel's post credit scene, they do a CGI rendering of the character that looks like it's based on the bone structure of what they use for Hulk and Thanos. That ends up making the character more comic accurate, like a smaller head in proportion to the rest of his body. But I do appreciate the practical effect here. Hank McCoy meets with the new U.S. president of this film, played by Yosef Summer. Bill Duke plays DHS secretary Trask, a nod to Bolivar Trask, creator of the Sentinel program. But Trask in this movie is never given a first name, and we meet a different Bolivar Trask, played by Peter Dinklage in Days of Future Past. We learn that Mystique had been impersonating Trask, so I guess she's moved on from Senator Kelly, but now she's being interrogated by an FBI agent, played by Anthony Heald, who played Dr. Chilton in The Silence of the Lambs and returned in 2003's prequel, Red Dragon, which Brett Ratner directed. Mystique 
Mystique says she doesn't answer to her slave name of Raven Darkholm, and she transforms into Magneto, wearing his 001 prisoner clothes from X2, and then into Heald's character. And I know I point this out in every movie, I love what other actors like do a Mystique impression. And here, Anthony Heald, in this split screen shot, himself does the first part of the stunt where he swipes the chair behind his back, at least before they cut to a different angle and a stunt person is swapped in. When she holds him from behind, Mystique snarls, as a kind of pejorative. So the president passes McCoy a file on Jimmy, AKA Leech. Leech in the comics was a member of the Morlocks with the power to drain or suppress superpowered beings within 50 feet of him. On his paperwork, you can see XDNA strand KLH conjugate, KLH or keynote limpet hemocyanin is used as a carrier protein in the production of antibodies. Charles lectures about mutant ethics. Kitty Pride is sitting in this classroom and to the left is Shauna Kane returning as Teresa Cassidy's siren. Connor Widows returns as Jones. That's the kid who blinked to change channels in X2. There's Kia Wong back as Jubilation Lee. She doesn't get any lines in this movie though. Luke Pohl returns as Flea. That is the kid that Colossus gave that doodle of Bobby and Rogue back in X2. Kitty Pride quotes Albert Einstein. The full quote is actually, I do not believe in immortality of the individual and I consider ethics to be an exclusively human concern with no superhuman authority behind it. It was in response to a letter from a Baptist pastor in 1953 about whether or not Einstein felt he had achieved everlasting life with his creator. But it's interesting here that the term superhuman is used in a different context. Einstein was using the word to talk about God. Taken out of context historically now, it's saying that superhumans might be gods, not bound by the same ethical principles as the rest of humanity. Charles puts it back in the context that Einstein wasn't a mutant, at least they don't think. Which begs the question that lots of characters throughout history might have actually been mutants and we just didn't know. Charles plays a recording from his colleague, Dr. Moira McTaggart, a geneticist and mutant ally from the comics, played by Olivia Williams in this movie, recast as Rose Byrne in an expanded role in X-Men First Class. The comatose patient that Charles poses, the hypothetical of transferring a consciousness into, says up the twist in the post credit scene. Storm and Charles walk through the school, passing this kid floating paper airplanes. This is supposedly Julian Keller Hellion. And behind them are some blonde triplets. These are the Stepford Cuckoos, clones of Emma Frost from the comics. Secretary McCoy joins them and briefs them about the announced mutant cure. He and Wolverine trade barbs as two furry fellas. He tells Logan, I've been fighting for mutant rights since before you had claws, boy. Not realizing that Logan, aka James Howlett, is a lot older than Hank McCoy. Wolverine was born like in the 1840s. We'll see that in X-Men Origins. We cut to Worthington Lab on Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay. X3 takes us to the West Coast for an island known as a prison, historically. In Loki season two, they'll actually visit Alcatraz and show how three of the escapees were actually variants of the TVA clocked. Now, the original idea for Alcatraz in this movie was for a lot of mutants to be imprisoned here. They were gonna use the prison cells of Alcatraz to keep mutants there. And the reason Magneto was gonna move the Golden Gate Bridge to this island originally was to liberate all these mutants and let them flee into the city. That set piece of the Golden Gate Bridge was insanely complicated. It actually took up a sixth of the film's budget. The effects crew had to begin work on it while the script was still coming together. So then when the script was changed so that Alcatraz was just gonna be used as like a location where Worthington Labs are and the only mutant in prison there is Leech, it just kind of makes it so that in the final version of the film, Magneto moves the bridge like just to move the Brotherhood from Marin County to the island. He could have just as easily summoned a fleet of boats to carry them across. It would have taken far less energy for Magneto and he would have been far more useful in that battle on the island. So yeah, the bridge scene looks awesome, but it's just kind of a visual spectacle with no logic purpose. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. A new year is a great excuse for finally tackling the stuff that you put off last year. And if one of the things you've been putting off until 2024 is taking proper care of your mental health, BetterHelp can help you get started. And hey, no judgment for waiting. Starting therapy can be hard and the right therapist for you might not be in your area and some people struggle with the face-to-face -face interaction of therapy. With BetterHelp, you can have your therapy sessions as a phone call, as a video chat, or even via messaging if you prefer that. Whatever is the most comfortable version of therapy for you. Just click the link in the description and answer a few questions about what you're looking for from therapy and what your preferences are, BetterHelp will then match you with the therapist from their network that's right for you. If you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a therapist for no additional cost without stressing about insurance, who is in your network, or anything like that. If you think you might benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash new rockstars. Clicking that link helps support this channel and also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so you can connect with a therapist to see if it helps you. Now, working under Dr. Worthington is Dr. Kavita Rao, played in this movie by the prolific and wonderful character actor Shorei Agdashlu. Dr. Rao comes from the Cure storyline in the Joss Whedon run. She is the scientist who develops the drug that they call Hope. Meanwhile, mutants meet in a town hall meeting. There's one mutant climbing on the ceiling credited in this movie as Lizard Man, but this is actually confirmed by Brett Ratner to be the mutant Enol. The mutant Fat, P-H-A-T, shrinks in size to sit on a pew. Magneto rises to say, no one ever talks about extermination, they just do it, hinting at his past at Auschwitz. We meet a mutant group called the Omegas in this film. Daniel Ramirez 
Ramirez plays Callisto, who has super speed and the ability to detect a mutant from afar. This is actually a power from the mutant Caliban. Mei Ling Melancon plays Psylocke, who will later be played by Olivia Munn in X-Men Apocalypse. Omahira Mona plays Arclight, a mutant who can cast shockwaves. And Ken Leung, who will later play the necromancer Miles Strom on Lost, plays Kid Omega as he's listed in the script. But based on his power set, he is absolutely the mutant Quill. And I believe in other interviews, they're like, yeah, he's, he's Quill. I don't know why we called him Kid Omega. We see that Callisto has an Omega tattoo on her chest. And actually the term Omega comes from Omega level mutant in the comics. That's the most powerful class of mutants. That includes Jean Grey and Wada Maximoff and Franklin Richards. Actually later, Callisto refers to some mutants as class three. And later Charles says that Jean is a class five. And all this seems to be an extension of this hierarchy structure. Now remember between X2 and 2003 and this movie in 2006, the success of the first two X-Men and the first two Spider-Man films led to things like Daredevil and the Fantastic Four movies. The Marvel films and the odds just kind of fell into a weird game of one-upmanship. Like how do we fit more superheroes and more supervillains and more superpowers in these movies? And it really wasn't until 2008 with Iron Man that Hollywood realized, hey, let's just focus on one hero at a time and let's be careful about how we build these ensemble team-ups in specific ways to combine power sets in unique combinations that like make sense visually. With X-Men The Last Stand, we just kind of like throw a lot of different powers against each other and it's just kind of a mess. But I still like to watch X-Men The Last Stand because it shows Kevin Feige learning these lessons the hard way. Yeah, his name is on these movies. He was making a lot of these decisions too. Dr. Rayo introduces Secretary McCoy to Jimmy, aka Leech, who is playing an Xbox game. Xbox, X-Men. Yeah, it is one of the first major Hollywood movies to feature an Xbox. It was a relatively new gaming system in these years. Actually, TikTok creator, the gaming pastor, was actually able to figure out the exact game that Jimmy is playing here, and it is Pitfall, The Lost Expedition. McCoy's hand reverts to flesh colored around Jimmy. X-Men First Class establishes that Hank McCoy's appearance is a result of him trying to cure his own mutation in the past, but instead he accidentally introduces a secondary mutation that caused him to become more animalistic in appearance. Scott Summers follows Gene Voice back to Alkali Lake, where there is a brief shot of a short-haired Famke Jansen screaming underwater. This is traumatic. So Scott blasts the lake with his optic blast, a whirlpool forms, and the phoenix rises. We see a transformed Gene with longer hair. Charles later explains that Gene survived by being wrapped in a cocoon of telekinetic activity, but I guess that cocoon did not stop her hair from growing out. Phoenix and Scott kiss, and we cut away before we see what happens to Scott. Only his sunglasses are left behind for Logan to find later. He doesn't even get an on-screen death. Charles tells Logan that Gene's phoenix identity manifested within her when he put his psionic blocks in her mind to control her. Again, I just think this is a missed opportunity, making Jean's monster coming from within her instead of where it should be coming from, the cosmos, from the unknown. I look back at this as part of a narrative trend of like trying to ground these stories and what was seen as a more understandable psychological framework as opposed to just full on embracing cosmic horror. There was actually a really great 2002 episode of Joss Whedon's Buffy the Vampire Slayer called Normal Again, in which all the events of the series are suggested to have been just a psychological delusion within Buffy's mind. That episode's so great because, you know, we just go back to the normal reality of the show where supernatural events occur, but we always wonder what if. Phase one of the MCU would carry on the tradition of trying to ground everything in some kind of reality, but when the Buffy creator Joss Whedon took over the franchise of 2012's Avengers, notice what happened. The MCU steered into a cosmic direction and definitely found its voice. And everything beyond that was characters reacting to the fact that wormholes to space exist, that Thanos is out there, that Infinity Stones exist. Comic book movies should not be afraid of cosmic horror. Ben Foster plays an older Warren Worthington, the third in this movie. He refuses to go through the drug treatment. He leaps out the window. This is a stunt that Ben Foster reportedly did himself. And he flies over the city of San Francisco toward Coit Tower, which fun fact is designed to look like the nozzle of a fire hose to honor our city's brave firefighters and how this city nearly burnt to a crisp in the early 20th century. I live in San Francisco and there is no like big high rise with this particular view of the city, but they did shoot this movie in Vancouver and they likely composited in the background of the city of San Francisco. Magneto wrecks the convoy to free Mystique and they free the other prisoners, which includes James Madrox, aka Multiple Man, played by Eric Dane from Grey's Anatomy and later Euphoria. Next, Juggernaut, played by Vinny Jones. Actually came into this role after working with Matthew Vaughn and Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels and Snatch. In the comics, Juggernaut is not a mutant, folks. He is Charles Xavier's stepbrother who winds up finding the Crimson Gem in the Temple of Sidorak, giving him superhuman strength. He wears his iconic dome helmet to protect him from mental attacks. And while he's not a mutant, he often aligns with and fights for the Brotherhood of Mutants. But none of that backstory is true in this film. He's just a mutant. Matthew Vaughn actually told Superhero hype in 2005 that he was hoping to put his friend Benny Jones in the movie because, quote, what's interesting about Juggernaut is that he's the brother of Professor X. That's why I thought it would be interesting to have an English thug opposite Patrick Stewart. Instead, Brett Reiner just uses the character as a battering ram. 
Mystique steps in front of a dart to save Magneto and immediately loses her powers. Magneto abandons her and the character just kind of disappears from the movie. We just see her one time later where it reveals that like she shared information with the government. It's clear that with James Marsden and Rebecca Romaine, a lot of these actors were just kind of like done with the franchise. Logan and Jean find themselves in reverse positions from where they met in the first film. There are three nodes on her chest, wires across her neck. I don't know, maybe you could see this as foreshadowing for the way Logan will have to kill her with three claws to the torso later. They make out and Logan's pretty freaked out. He asks what happened to Scott and the lab goes crazy. And Jean says, yeah, it's impossible for a character to say kill me and for it not to be a reference to alien or aliens. Kill me. Kill me. Logan tells her that Charles can't fix it and the Phoenix returns. Jean escapes, Logan, Storm, and Charles deduce that she must have killed Scott, and no one feels anything. They just kind of move on, and they return to Jean's neighborhood, and there is this ridiculous shot. Wait for me here. What? I need to see Jean alone. You were right, Charles. This one is special. Do they not see Magneto standing there in the middle of the street with Juggernaut as they approach the house? Notice how Magneto is back in his helmet. We should note that Magneto's helmet in the comics was not historically known to block out psionic waves. That was just kind of an invention for the first X-Men film and they adopted it in other media thereafter. And in fact, at times in the comics, the helmet was known to give Magneto telepathy. Charles and Eric confront Jean who unleashes her telekinesis on the house to try to repel Charles. Logan and Storm charge in. Juggernaut, despite being told to keep them out, just kind of throws Wolverine directly into the living room. Storm fights Callisto who throws her from the left and then zips around to catch her on the right. Very cool. A deleted scene would have shown Storm conducting lightning through Wolverine to electrocute Juggernaut until he passed out. You can tell the VFX artists worked really hard to manifest Phoenix's powers with some trippy illusions like having the water pour from the sink and flatten on the ceiling. It's just because all we know of the Phoenix in this movie is that she's some evil alternate identity inside of Jean's mind. We don't really know why this telekinesis matters. It's just kind of like random sorcery. The psychic battle between Charles and Phoenix lifts Charles out of the chair. Everything slows down as Logan witnesses Charles' final moments. Don't let it control you. <laughs> Charles is completely obliterated and it's the first of three times we will see Charles Xavier die. Storm eulogizes Charles, who gets a massive headstone and an eternal flame. We should note, at this point, there is still not a headstone or a service for Scott Summers. And I honestly think rewatching this movie, it's because when they shot these scenes, they didn't yet know how much of the movie Scott Summers was going to be in. Like they needed all those actors to be there for the funeral scene. And I just think that it's possible that they didn't know at that point when they were making this movie that they were gonna kill off Cyclops at that point. Magneto brings Gene back to his brotherhood campsite. A lot of REI vibes at this point in the movie, folks. Gene dismantles a serum gun and aims the darts at Eric, calling back when Magneto redirected the guns of the cops outside the train station in the first movie. A deleted scene would have shown Jean demonstrating her power by turning a cup into a glowing ball of energy, sending shockwaves through the camp. That's why in the scene after this with the Omegas and Pyro complaining about Jean Grey, you could see other Brotherhood mutants in the back just trying to put their REI gear back up. Now it's not really clear where this campsite is. I assume Marin County, since they all have to go to the bridge on foot, but there are definitely mountains that I'm pretty sure are just like Canada outside of Vancouver. Scenes in this part of the movie are crazy. Crazy folks. We jump around from these woods. We're in Westchester, New York. Then we're in the San Francisco Bay Area. There's a clinic that Bobby and Pyro are outside of where it says Washington. Is it Washington State or Washington DC? And then Logan from Westchester responds to psychic visions from Jean and just kind of like knows where in all of North America to go find her. In the middle of this, we see a section where military soldiers are transferring their weapons from metal ones to plastic ones with serum darts. And there's actually a vocal cameo by R. Lee Ermey from Full Metal Jacket who's barking at all of them. Wolverine fights with bone dagger slinging mutant Spike who's played by Lance Gibson. This is based on the character Spike introduced in X-Force in 2001, and along with Fat were members of the X-Statics comic team. This fight scene that was actually added to make it a more even fight because otherwise the sequence would have just been Wolverine arriving in the woods at the Brotherhood camp and suddenly massacring mutants he came across. So notice instead they intercut Wolverine killing these other mutants who don't even seem to be attacking him with these new shots of the bone daggers flying at him. Like killing all these other random people wasn't self-defense because he was that bad at Spike. Charles finds Wolverine and flings him across the woods. Meanwhile, the president and Trask send a task force to the Brotherhood camp, but they use multiple men as a decoy. Back at the mansion, the X-Men suit up and 
suits are all black leather. Hank McCoy, after resigning, has now gone back to like his pants and a shirtless vest. Nice. Well, Wolverine, Storm, Iceman, Shadowcat, and Colossus all have alternate color trim on their respective suits. Storm's suit has a silver cape. Now, I gotta say, The Last Stand is, in my opinion, in the lower tier of X-Men movies, at least when it comes to the suit up and charge in the final battle. Like, really? We don't even get Rogue? Even Bobby Drake is like, do we really want this to be the final fight of the movie? I'm happy to sit out. But hey, there was a deleted scene that would have shown Beast reciting Shakespeare's Henry V, Act 4. We happy if you, we band of brothers. For he who sheds his blood with me this day shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile. This day shall gentle his condition. And men in England now are bed. We'll count their manhoods cheap. They were not here with us to fight on Crispin's day. So here's the big moment. Magneto attacks the Golden Gate Bridge. And again, he really just does this so that Juggernaut doesn't have to swim or take a ferry to Alcatraz. In the car, we see these kids playing. Hey, again, it's Pitfall the Lost Expedition. Yes, Leech's favorite game makes a second cameo in this movie. Except notice they are playing on a PlayStation. And I don't know why they both have controllers. This is a single player game. And they have a PlayStation in their car in 2006? Wow. Now this attack on the Golden Gate Bridge, as I mentioned before, was a massive set piece. It involved millions of dollars with the scale model that they use for the effects planning and then a larger 1 12th scale model that they can move around to make the flying bridge effects. But having this in the movie was deemed super important because after 9-11, Hollywood was still afraid to stage implosions and explosions in New York City or in Washington, D.C. Executive producer Lauren Schuller Donner's husband, Richard Donner, staged a scene in the 1978 Superman film that was on the Golden Gate Bridge. There's actually a moment during the run of the new X-Men comics in 2003 where Magneto takes over New York City by ripping up all the bridges and metal substances structure. He was high on the mutant drug Kick at the time. Kevin Feige, as a producer of this movie, even said that they used that moment from the comics as inspiration for how to show Magneto's incredible power, though he incorrectly cited the Ultimate X-Men. Magneto moves the bridge so that it connects Alcatraz to what looks like the Fort Mason part of San Francisco. While the bridge would not be able to stay suspended like that over the water without its support beams going down into the mud under the bay, I will admit that the actual length of the bridge would probably cover the distance between Alcatraz and the shoreline. Magneto stops the Juggernaut from charging in initially by saying, in chest the pawns go first. Yes, because the way Charles and Eric frame this whole conflict is a chess match. But unfortunately, on the other side of the table, Charles isn't there for Eric to play against. So you know his heart really isn't in this battle. We see one of these mutants teleporting forward. This could be Vanisher, who will make an appearance on the X-Force in Deadpool 2, played by a much more recognizable actor. Now, the human soldiers are firing these serum darts, and they have so many of them. They include these cluster grenades that just spray out like hundreds of them. One of the early casualties on the Brotherhood side is Glob Herman, a mutant whose powers are literally just transparent wax skin. We see Anol, the lizard man, changing and falling from his perch. Arclight finally steps in by sending in shockwaves. The blackbird arrives, and Beast says this. Who my stars and garters? Yes, this is one of Beast's most verbose catchphrases. Beast first says this in 1975's Avengers number 137. Supposedly, it was Kevin Feige who really pushed for him to get this line in the film. Magneto sends in a second wave. The mutant Ash burns some humans. The X-Men arrive and face off against the Brotherhood, and Magneto says, Traitors to their own cause. And so far, this charge is the closest thing we've gotten to X-Men vs. Brotherhood charge in the 90s animated show intro. Among these attacks, a deleted scene would have shown Storm summoning a wave from the bay and then electrocuting the water. Other deleted shots would have shown Iceman freezing and smashing fat and Beast breaking a mutant's neck backwards. What we do see, though, is Kitty Pride running through a person and grabbing him from behind to slam him down. In the comics, she has ripped out a heart before, so I'm glad she didn't do that here. Or, you know, it would have been pretty cool if she did. Juggernaut charges into the lab to kill Jimmy. Yeah, we definitely heard the sound of bowling pins there. Kitty races after him. Wolverine slashes this mutant who can regenerate his limbs. This guy's name is apparently Starfish. I don't think there's a mutant named Starfish in Marvel Comics, but I guess they just created another regenerative mutant just for this bit. Come on! <laughs> Grow those back. I actually would love for Logan to call this back while fighting Deadpool in Deadpool 3. Kitty pulls Juggernaut through the floor and traps him there briefly. Don't you know who I am? I'm the Juggernaut, bitch! Ha, you gotta love it. Quill, AKA Kid Omega, kills Dr. Real with the world's worst hug. Otherwise, I gotta say, pretty useless power set. And he's considered one of the Omegas? I don't know, I would take fat. Juggernaut chases Kitty through the facility. She reaches Jimmy, but Leech dampens her power so that she has to trick Juggernaut into knocking himself out. A removed version of the scene would have had him referencing the Shining by saying, Here's Juggy. Yes. 
Juggy. Storm kills Callisto, electrifying her against a metal fence. <laughs> this crazy detail, you can see her lip ring sizzling and cool down. Magneto and Pyro <laughs> escalate the battle by launching cars that Pyro blows up. It's essentially the same setup from the Danger Room defensive practice session for the beginning of the movie. Wolverine remembers they have to work as a team, and he has Colossus throw him fastball special style at Magneto, but it was just a distraction for Beast to sneak up from behind and inject Magneto with the cure. In a deleted scene, Magneto would have actually tortured Wolverine by bending the adamantium all over his body, causing excruciating pain. So seeing Eric Lyncher losing his power, Phoenix finally steps in and she starts obliterating everyone and everything. Only Wolverine with his regenerative powers can withstand this, and Jean starts with his suit. And we're kind of back to that flirty line from the first movie, couldn't wait to get my shirt up again, could you? Jean is able to break through all this madness and she begs Wolverine to save her, and he sneaks through her stomach. Back at the mansion, two smaller headstones are finally put up for Scott Summers and Jean Grey. Rogue reveals that she took the cure and she and Bobby hold hands, but there is an alternate ending where Rogue says that she couldn't go through with it. Either way, assuming this cure is ultimately ineffective based off of the scene with Magneto, if Rogue and Bobby ever escalate beyond handholding, yeah, look out Bobby, you're gonna look like Colossus's doodle. We learn that Beast is now the ambassador to the UN, which makes me wonder who's gonna take his place as Secretary of Mutant Affairs. I think Aurora Monroe would be a good candidate. Angel flies past the Golden Gate Bridge, which is now to repair and we see Eric Lyncher sitting at a chess table by himself. Two other players play with red and white pieces, kind of reminding us of the red and white sides of mutants versus humans in X2. Eric Lyncher ever so slightly is able to nudge his metal piece. His powers are returning. That piece is the king. And we are reminded of TH White's the once and future king. But you only ever move your king as a defensive move to avoid a checkmate or to topple it to signal defeat. And ultimately, despite his powers coming back here, I think Eric Lyncher is admitting defeat because he has lost his friend who he would be playing this chess game with. Or did he? Because the post credit scene takes us back to Moira McTaggart's hospital room. Morning. Hello, Moira. Charles. Oh boy, so presumably Charles is not dead, his consciousness just transferred to this patient, but the X-Men film series never really picks up with this. There is an alternate ending or a post credit scene that would have taken Logan back to that Alberta, Canada bar with the same bartender from the first X-Men film. You headed home? Something like that. Okay, Deadpool 3 spoilers coming in the danger room. I avoided talking about Storm's new haircut in this movie. Halle Berry got an awesome glow up for this role. And it's so memorable that fans who follow Halle Berry on social media were pretty curious over a May 2023 Instagram post that showed Halle Berry with a new white spiky do. Could this mean that we are going to see Halle Berry Storm in Deadpool 3? Thank you so much for watching this. Next week, we're going to be talking about X-Men Origins Wolverine, a movie that's probably going to get quite a few callbacks in Deadpool. Three. I want to thank Eric Wusu and Brandon Barrick for helping me write this script. You can support new rock stars by grabbing some merch from nerdriot.shop. Follow me on all social platforms at EAVOS and subscribe to all three channels in the New Rockstars Network. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.